my role as uh, uh, the chairman of uh, this section uh, is due to my position uh, in the board of Black Universities Network. But I will try to do my best. And uh, I am really looking forward to hear the keynote, keynote speeches. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, in the end, uh, your contributions, uh, uh, discussions on uh, uh, the issues, uh, thesis presented by uh, uh, the five speakers. Uh, the first uh, speaker is uh, uh, Professor Jerry, uh, Gary Jacobs. Uh, uh, World Academy of uh, Arts and Science uh, uh, President. Uh, I'll give the floor to uh, uh, Gary Jacobs. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, the next one will be Dr. Abzal uh, Ashraf uh, from uh, uh, Loboro University. Uh, so, uh, President uh, Jacobs, the floor is yours. Please address to the participants. Thank you very much. Professor Preda and uh, Eden Mahmoud and uh, all of the support that uh, has been given by the Black Sea University Network. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to just say how significant it is for me that we're, con we're connected at the time of the 25th anniversary of the Black Sea University Network. And you mentioned uh, Mirso Maletza, who was a very distinguished and important member of the World Academy. And I happen to remember the time uh, back in the late 90s when a meeting was, the first meeting was being con uh, convened in the Black Sea. And I was just a, a recently elected fellow of the Academy. I was not able to join, but I remember the president of the Academy telling me he's on the way uh, to the Black Sea for this very important event. I didn't dream at that time that 25 years later we would be together to celebrate. So what I missed then uh, has come now and hearty congratulations for the wonderful work that you're doing. I'd like to also reflect a little about how this topic of AI and the topic we have now is so important to the work of the Academy with a little flashback on our own history, uh, which started some of you may know with the Manhattan Project uh, uh, with uh, that produced the first atomic bomb, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, uh, who was the father or the, the head of the project, was also one of the co-founders of the World Academy some 15 years later. Uh, and I mentioned that because how significant it was. It's hard for us to recall that at that time, some 75 years ago, that the role of science in the politics of the world, in the governance of the world, played a very minimal role. Scientists were more living in an ivory tower uh, and doing their research. And in this time, certainly those who were involved in, in, in creating the weapon uh, felt they were doing so for the survival of humanity. Uh, but it soon became evident uh, by the time the, the atomic bomb was developed, the war in, in Europe was over, and yet decision was made still on the necessity to use this weapon. And people like Oppenheimer, Niels Bohr, and other very distinguished scientists, Isaac uh, Einstein, who was part of the whole thing, uh, pleaded that at this time, 75 years ago, we do something to stop the proliferation of the negative uses of atomic energy uh, and warn that if we don't do that, that uh, we have let a genie out of the box and the consequences would be difficult to control. And here it is 75 years later, and we're still not able to master the genie of uh, atomic uh, energy. And yet, ironically, that in this time when climate change is such a threat, renewed breakthroughs and progress in nuclear energy, and perhaps we have some real experts in the field about the latest developments, suggest that it could be uh, one of the major remedies to the problems we're facing uh, with as a peaceful uh, source of energy. Yet because we didn't tackle the problem of governing it 75 years ago, there's a great aversion to uh, to emphasizing it and investing in it now. 
And I'm mentioning that because I think there's an obvious parallel. Uh, the developments in uh, artificial intelligence are perhaps the greatest technological breakthrough of all time with the greatest potential benefits to the future of humanity. Uh, and we've hardly begun to scratch the surface into the ways they could be used to positively service and meet the human needs and meet the human security needs of humanity. But if we don't get it right now, and if we don't find the proper way to manage and govern the technology, the great power that's being released now, we may seriously impair our capacity to fully utilize its power for positive good in future. As we all know, technology, like many other things, is a double-edged sword. It can be fully used powerfully as a remarkable tool for progress. It can also be used uh, in, in, in other ways, and as was already mentioned, I think by Ibn, uh, with the war that's going on. So in your region now, uh, artificial intelligence is already playing a role uh, uh, that, uh, that is at least ambiguous, uh, depending on which perspective we take. But it's certainly not promoting peace and security for the region or for the world, uh, even though uh, it, those who are using it may feel it's essential for their security and survival. This is a world do global dilemma and a global solution is necessary. I just came, I would have loved to join you in this beautiful place in Bulgaria uh, by the sea, uh, but I was just, just came back from New York. We had a very important meeting at the United Nations with the Consumer Technology Association, which we have been partnering in. We launched global campaign from human security for all, uh, in uh, January of last year at the Consumer Electronics Show uh, in, the, in Las Vegas, the largest technology event in the world with about 120,000 leaders in, of science and of technology and business coming together. And uh, human security was made the theme of that event, the first time in 100 years that the event had been themed, recognizing that Technology has a tremendous role to play in the future of human uh, security, in meeting our human security needs for food, for health, uh, for ecological, for in managing the climate and the environment, uh, generating the economic growth we need in education, in, in, in governance, in all fields. And the response we got to that conference with so many leaders was, the recognition that the technology leaders have a great responsibility to see that this technology is used for the good of all humanity. So much so that they've joined hands with the UN and we had our uh, uh, the second event just last week uh, in which we're working with the UN and the technology leaders on how we can really handle this force as a force for good that solves the problems rather than created, uh, creating uh, others, uh, new ones. And we know today what a tremendous opportunity and potential uh, that is. Uh, particularly, or um, as an example, perhaps, in the field of education where so many of us are involved, the potential of meeting the future educational needs of the world and transforming our delivery system and making affordable, high quality, world-class education available, customized, personalized uh, uh, education, of uh, interactive education available to everybody uh, has just begun to, beginning to open up and it may be transforming. I believe it will transform our global education uh, in the decades to come. Uh, on the other side, we know that if we don't get the, the, the the governance of this right and the collaboration right, uh, not only the military diffusion and proliferation and a new types of arms race uh, will be there, the proliferation of fake news, the destabilization of polit uh, politics and governance and stability in society of freedom and human rights can be under, uh, undermined at the same time. So the stakes are very high and that's why it's so important 
uh, to have meetings like this, to recognize the tremendous powers, and at the same time to recognize uh, the limitations. Uh, and I think it's very significant that as, 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 as 75 years ago, but much more so today, we see the, the leaders of business coming forward, the leaders, the technology developers coming forward and asking for tech for governance. In fact, when I was in New York with the, at the UN, our, our, our partners from the Consumer Technology Association were just on their way to Washington to meet with the Senate uh, members, the Congress members on working on strategies for, uh, uh, for governance. So our role, the role of scientists, the role of technology developers, the role of educators is not only to work on the science uh, and the technological potentials, but to work very closely with policymakers, uh, with business leaders on finding a way that we can make this uh, purely and most powerfully a force for good in the world, that we'll look back on this as a very tremendous period of breakthrough for humanity. And just as a closing remark, uh, there is so much, there's an urgent need that we do something. We now have the, the principles for governance and standards for governance being developed very progressively in the EU with the EU uh, AI Act, in the OECD, uh, we met with UNESCO just last week, and their uh, interest, is very great interest in doing something. I think there is a role for academia and research institutes to play a very active role, not only in the development, uh, but in, uh, uh, in, in working in partnership on governance. And who knows, uh, one way to do that might be very symbolically uh, for the Black Sea University uh, network representing this very important region today to come forward and be a leader in declaring something similar to a nuclear free zone, not a zone free from uh, uh, artificial intelligence because it's the future to drive our growth, but a, a zone in which as a model of governance and a model of commitment that we commit to the most positive, to become an example of the positive use of this technology for the human security of all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, President uh, Jacobs. Uh, and I, I now pass the floor to uh, Dr. Dr. Afzal uh, Ashraf uh, from uh, Loughborough University. Uh, Dr. Ashraf, uh, the floor is yours. It's an enormous uh, privilege for me uh, from uh, an obscure university in the UK uh, to be invited here um, by the University of Sophia uh, to present to the Black Sea University Network, I believe, 12 countries uh, with uh, hundreds of members, uh, and I feel somewhat overall, um, and especially dealing with this huge question of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, um, and the challenges it poses, particularly for human security. Now, the very fact that we're holding this uh, conference um, in a region, um, uh, which is an important part of the world, not on a national basis, but on a regional basis, uh, makes uh, a strong case for what I'm uh, trying to uh, contribute to uncovering, and the, that is the importance of the international dimension. And in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I hope uh, not much longer, I wish to open up a discussion on a number of subjects that I consider relevant. Of course, my choice uh, is far from exhaustive, nor is it necessarily the important topics. It's the ones that uh, have come to mind. And I very much hope uh, that um, uh, I will have built on the excellent talk that we just had uh, from uh, Mr. Gary Jacobs, uh, and indeed um, that will follow mine. Um, and I hope that some of the points that I raise will excite questions, because uh, none of us has the answers. But what we can all do is contribute to uh, providing 
some of the, the, the elements of the debate. So I'm going to very roughly talk about international relations and power, the impact on international economics, and the impact on learning and ethics. Um, now, uh, I won't um, bore you with uh, definitions uh, um, of AI. Of course, there's a, um, a whole career in universities to be had with that. Um, the Turing test uh, still remains the touchstone of definitions. And according to um, uh, Stephen Pemberton, who some of you will know is uh, one of the inventors of the World Wide Web, and also the author of many uh, of our contemporary software languages, including XML, um, he uh, says what I think most of us agree with, and that is that um, AI is not truly intelligent. Uh, he suggests that it certainly could be in the future some of us, um, perhaps from the social sciences, uh, can't imagine how machines could replicate, even simulate uh, the uh, emotions and the creativity and the spirituality that human beings have. Of course, that's a, a, a huge area. But the two categories that involve uh, artificial intelligence, what we call narrow uh, systems designed to train and train for a specific task, for example, voice recognition persistence. Um, and then we've got the general AI system possessing generalized human cognitive abilities or simulation of cognitive abilities. Um, these are areas that are only just coming in, um, but haven't quite uh, been achieved. And of course, there is concern or, or a debate as to whether they will be achieved. It's a second area. It's the stimulation of cognitive abilities that presents the most challenge and indeed presents the greatest uh, opportunities for human development. Um, now the scope uh, for AI spans various fields of machine learning, where systems improve and automate uh, decisions or activities of data, and neural networks which aim to replicate human brain connections through robotics, natural language processing, and expert systems. Again, this second area of human simulation is where the greatest scope for development exists and consequently where the greatest potential for dangers and benefits arises. Now, I want to very quickly uh, talk about how um, AI, which rather like the internet, doesn't really um, develop and have the right impacts without uh, related technologies. The reason why we're here today is using the internet is because of technologies uh, that are developed. For example, uh, we all have these things. And it's this technology that has enabled the explosion of the use of the internet. So we know about quantum computing and how that would dramatically speed our AI. We know about the Internet of Things and how that is already and will dramatically increase the amount of data. We know about 5G uh, the technology, how that's speeding up data. We know about, I think some of us at least, uh, neuromorphic engineering, which aims to mimic human brain architectures in silicon, in electronics, so that it can improve those electronics. We know about biotechnology, some of us, and how AI has been integrated already with biotechnology, the tasks like discovering drugs to, and also discover um, the, the way our bodies work. So simultaneously discovering how our bodies work and how they go wrong, and drugs that can help put things right. We also uh, know that edge computing, that is computing that uh, process is closer to the workplace, how that is uh, speeding up efficiency or increasing efficiency and uh, improving latency of this. Blockchain technology that's developing um, is also considered uh, an important area. Ironically, blockchain is professed to give us greater reliability of this. Is that really true? Blockchains will tell us very reliably if the data generated is the same as the data that we have received, but it doesn't tell us if the data generated by AI or by any other means is um, accurate. Uh, it doesn't tell us whether it's um, uh, in some ways um, uh, 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 honest, wise, 
uh, or in any way useful. Um, so let's not um, uh, look at these things um, uh, and, and take the wrong lessons. Scholars like Tech Market uh, 2017 caution that while these integrations uh, with other technologies are promising, they bring ethical and safety concerns. The blend of AI with other technologies could outpace regulatory systems, as we've heard already. And all of this, AI and these technologies, uh, require governance measures. And uh, again, uh, um, uh, Gary Jacobs made a very strong case for this governance. The point that I want to make is that governance of AI, almost by definition, has to be international because electrons don't have passports and they don't stop at borders. And so this is why the international geopolitical dimension is important. Um, now, these predictions that I talked about with technology are very obvious and possibly unlikely to have the most transformative impact on society. And I make this point because decades ago, IBM used the rate of computer growth in mainframe computers to suggest that the world's future um, in, in computing that relies or will rely on two or three mainframes. And the reality, of course, we all know is that the PCs, these things that we have on our tables that we all individually have, is what has replaced the mainframe. And it's this um, uh, fusion of technology and individuality with all of our creativity, all of our ability to think differently, the diversity that we all possess that has had the most amazing and phenomenal impact on society, even as we uh, live and breathe. The fact that we are here talking to people um, uh, across many countries remotely um, is one of those uh, examples of where, where humans and technology and information come together, but then there is this much. And so my um, point here is this, that it is where artificial intelligence interfaces with the human. And one of those bridges is actually in the development of software languages. Let's have a very quick think about what that means. Already, and that people haven't really, uh, society hasn't really noticed this. Already, software languages have transformed both the way we use computers and the economic impact of, of, of computing. In the 1950s, computers were so expensive, people could hire the use of the computer, the corporations could hire, and the companies that made them provided uh, software programmers for free. In the uh, 70s and 80s, um, the computers were so much cheaper and got even cheaper that um, the program was the most expensive element. Today, um, we have uh, many examples where um, uh, companies uh, are investing in huge amounts of time and money to produce software applications. Let me just give you one example. Um, the British National Health Service spent seven years, billions of pounds, to develop a uh, patient management system using conventional um, language. It took seven years, billions of pounds, it cost five pounds per patient, and it failed. It took one year, it took hundreds of thousands and less. It took just a handful of programmers or a dozen maybe. And a system based on X forms has been able to do what the previous system couldn't do at the fraction of the cost, at less than one penny per patient. It's working, and by the way, it's just recently been rolled out to the play. In another example, uh, a, a, a CEO of an insurance company asked his programmers to develop a, a, an application 
He said, come back in two days. He's conventional programmers came back in two days, said that they would need 30 days in order to give him the project timeline for this. In two days, he had asked an XML programmer who had actually delivered the product. We are talking about an exponential uh, uh, decrease in time and space. And of course, we all know that AI has the ability to um, not just program, but it will have the ability, if it has it already, to create new languages. It will take our language, your language and mine, and give the, uh, and, and write the programs. What does this really mean? What this means for geopolitics is this. Before I tell you what it means, let's just go back to history and see what we've done, what we've seen in the past. In most of our lifetime, the CEOs of most uh, industrial corporations across the world were from industrial nations, mainly Europeans and North Americans, occasionally Japanese. Now, virtually all of the or vast majority of the CEOs of American technology corporations are from Indian origin. Why is that? Because in very simple terms, India is not weighed down by the legacy of those industrial concepts, both of education and infrastructure. But they have gone for the cheap option, which is software and demand. So what is it to stop with AI in the future being cheaply and more uh, uh, readily available? A young man or a woman in a village in Africa to use AI to produce applications without the benefit of having to learn a language that could solve problems in the world. There's a great deal to be thought about and said here. Um, and of course, a great deal has already been said about economics, um, that uh, the, they will lead to losses of jobs. Yes, they will, but it's how do we react to those transformations? In my own experience, and of course, I am uh, open to challenge, most of the jobs that have been lost through technology have been mundane jobs. I have never come across an individual who said, oh gosh, I wish the computers hadn't lost my job. Typists, most of us, again, remember, huge offices full of women typing day after day stuff. That was my money. Now women who were typists have jobs that utilize their innate capability, their innate intelligence. Uh, but the point is this, uh, that um, uh, what we need to do is to learn to react. And ironically, it is universities where most of the places that most of us come from that are the most uh, inflexible and the slowest to react. Uh, I can give examples and questions of how long it takes to introduce even a new course in my universities in the UK. I guess it wouldn't be very much more different. Financial systems are likely to change. Um, uh, AI is already using uh, the use to uh, undermine the systems in markets. It could actually change the nature of markets. Uh, it could change the nature of currencies. We may actually go back to penny currencies, uh, to things like gold and other valuable commodities. Impact on learning, very briefly, um, and ethics, I will talk about very briefly. Adaptive learning engines have been here. Area 9 produced them for 10 years. Um, I'm very enthusiastic, as you can see. Um, ethics is a huge area. Let me very quickly talk about one area. We worry about um, robotic weapons killing innocent people. It's very right to be worried. But let's not assume that uh, human beings do not kill innocent people. We just kid ourselves that we don't. In Afghanistan, one particular occasion, about a million years, uh, American operatives saw uh, a family stop and men get out and pray. The men were of fighting age. And the fact that they were praying their daily prayers made them think that they're likely to be Taliban and they killed them more than a dozen of them, and some of the women and children that come from them. So maybe AI will make us challenge our own ethical systems 
indeed the uh, affairs of our economic systems and our political systems. And if that's all AI does, it will be a great Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, we now uh, move to Professor uh, Mesut Haki Kashin from uh, Editepe University. Uh, Professor Kashin, uh, you have the floor. If you could limit to 10, uh, 12 minutes, uh, we would be glad. Thank you. Please take the, take the floor. Yeah, the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish a special thanks to all the all distinguished professors and in around the Black Sea. And I hope this honorable people, Mr. Professor Marian and Mr. Mahmoud, uh, it's very big honor for me, this good and very uh, highly appreciate the invitation. In my presentation, I will to talk together you just in a short time how uh, Aerial C and the uh, the unmanned systems accelerate the changing nature of the Black Sea and the global security. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation regarding to what's happening the uh, first quarter of the 21st century <coughs> modern aviation advanced the technologies uh, and then uh, artificial intelligence, even though so fair and experience great, is a kind of the revolutionary change. This is beginning AI technical level and pricing level of the world, destroying the some batteries, tanks, and armed vehicles, even though convoys and surface sea platforms cultivate the search and rescue operations, the battlefield, the one that soldiers and waving rescue areas of the land. Regarding this position, AI technology and military will transform the future warfare and the down so fear and follow the human instructions it's big value going up in industrial and economical manner. Many technological advances were the case of future conflict, including in drones, so fear deploying and warfare, AI and space technology, as well as cyber warfare. And then first commercial space world, first full scale the drone world, and AI world we see in ongoing pictures in around the Black Sea. Now my question in an economic manner, why we need to military robots in future battlefield, the technologies become the quite important for the defense and global dimension and results the desert fighters and superior defense capabilities and decrease the human losses and reduce the removing military personnel and robot system will provide a big military advantage in this regard. And in my academic, the, the focus and the question is double. How will did this robotic system impact the balance of power in Black Sea and even the global security? How will the international community promote global warfare and regarding the proliferation use of robotic unmanned weapon systems in Russia and Ukraine warfare? Robotic weapon, the weapon platforms is going to the change the ultimate nature of the war. And even though we see some of the like this, for example, Service members are in conflict, maintain numerical parity with the enemy and the spirit about it. Now, the rapid deployment of AI, new advanced capabilities in both military and non military domains, spraying fields, firefighting rebels, and then extinguish the fires to kill the rebels, also using in around it. Not only the, is it movies, but the trade of drones swarm over farming states, military installations. Cyber attacks and critical infrastructure for the hypersonic missiles automatically launch the sensor and detect the threats. Now, four main factors I focus on the influence to develop on military robots. Desire reduce the loss of the armed troops, gradually increase complex of the armed conflict, the arms race ongoing, and compensation size of the armed forces. Ladies and gentlemen, these anti-missile systems and artificial intelligence capability. Going intercept the, is the hypersonic the missiles. We see especially the Russia send out many the missiles against Ukraine, the targets. The AIV the, and also principles humanitarian law, proportional day and differential maximum action inside of the terms of the law. They still uncertain among the international law and conventions and have not come up the international solution which kind of the claims in uncertainty. Respective to curse, 
international sphere is uncertain regarding this position. Today, there is an ongoing international arms race in the field of the field of the future AI and emphasize warfare strategies and game changing regarding the picture. And looking as a lawyer, what about the legal and ethical arguments about the ATV systems, weapon systems, critical functions about the violent first? And first, international humanitarian law, distinguish between the combatants and civilians. How can they detect it? Second, the missions have moral implications regarding the instability, understanding, ending the human life. Thirdly, in terms of the international law society, fears AID, like this particular daily use actors, not accountability. This is very critical legal point use of words. Even now, this is the preferred next step to take in field of the military robotics. Now, when you're looking at the Black Sea, we see the different picture, but the, you remember the World War II, course battles in World War II, German armies defeated by the Red Army in the Alta Order, the drowned of Vincent Churchill says regarding this type, the Mr. Stalin, the beginning of the call for a period of time. You remember famous, the, 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 the people, Mr. Brzezinski, Yalta is unfinished business. For years ago, the Yalta struggle still involves America and Russia. Now it will be clear, unlike the result in a strictly constructive manner, until the more active role assumed the very object in the European. Now, Russia full scale invasion, however, second time in eight years, Russia had military force size in Ukrainian sovereign territory unlawfully. Illegal the annexion of the Crimean Peninsula permitted the Russia's Black Sea fleet a virtual and entire the Black Sea. And we see many attacks to the, the, the Ukraine, the targets. Now, Russia Ukraine war, intensive use of unmanned robotic weapon systems, is it really a game changer? We see in the sea, we see in the cell, the air, and the, this, the, the, the system using very harsh in the warfare. Russian fighters threatened to intercept US UID and the Black Sea airspace, and these systems procured by the Iran and also North Korea. Even though Russia maximized its electronic warfare capability, ability to defend against drone attacks by the Black Sea Navy in front line. I appointed two important points what the hybrid war, and even though this system equipped artificial intelligence, and equipped with the exclusive against the military, but sometimes the civilian targets. This is very difficult for us. Now, now the all the deterrent states, the, 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 the afraid when we see sea mines in the Black Sea is a big the threat against human security and human life. On the other hand, we are looking at Ukraine side. Ukraine at first, the NATO established, accelerated the, the joint to the NATO. And Ukraine against our cities, phase of the intense attacks in the rains and even the ports and the need to corresponding intensity, Russia at the strength of air defense team, Mr. Zelensky, the, uh, the name of the Ukraine. The Western high technology precision, the Ukraine able to combat Russian warfare tactics, tactics and even the Russian Air Force dominate the and air war, but the is always underground this is special military operation in terms of the international law of warfare. We see Ukraine used to conduct the drones, primary tasks, surveillance, intelligence, strikes, and coordination about the, the drone attacks. But the space has been critical. You know that starting satellites, American company SpaceX, and provide access to high speed indeed in internet systems. Ukraine has quite its Black Sea fleet in Sevastopol. Russia sources in the final point, you remember that storm shadow made in UK, scout missiles, they launched Ukraine aircraft. They, the, the, the target, Rapushka Kulash landing ship means, and even though very modern Sevastopol, the Rostov in the Kula class the submarine. This is first of all in the, the love of the warfare time. And even though naval news, Ukraine and Toloka, is underwater vehicle is going up. The Russians say, they say we are on the happy to see the enlargement of NATO and also the, the, the uh, also 
color the revelation and uh, despite the great power equipped the diplomatic capability and politics and material, they decide the, we are unhappy the, the matter. Russia, the agency is helping plan attack the Lexi fleet. As a result, the, the Russia says we are close coordination with the, the Western intelligence means and satellite. Now I'm coming to final point, what's happening now to increase Black Sea. Mr. Uh, the Secretary General says most wars less longer than expected, but the Putin has to be laid down the response, the order like this. As a result, Article 79, the Allied says in the business summit, freedom of navigation, Black Sea is very important according to Monterey Convention, Mr. Chairman. And the Turkey looking peaceful policies, meditating and preventing global conflict, positively won the nuclear warfare. Now we are responsible to make also corridor of the agreement of the grain, the Antalya negotiation prisoner changing and counter in order to end of the warfare. As a result, the NATO country Erdogan continues to negotiate and diplomatic dialogue and the arbitration of the Turkey role. Mr. Erdogan says in the United Nations and also in Turkey, peace has no laws. And since the beginning, Russian Ukraine endeavoring the, in the Kiev and both Russian Ukraine friends around the table and will have no losers. There is no doubt that Ukraine deserves the NATO membership. And the Zelensky says, happy to hear that Turkey supports. Now, as a result, I'm coming to also the dialogue. We are support in the Black Sea Oil also initiative launch the, in order to prevent global hunger crisis in the Black Sea is very important. Conclusion. Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen, a, this robotic system obligate in general principles of humanitarian law. Proportionally and also differential maximum extent need to comply the law of armed conflict and weapon types unnecessary suffering, very important. Weapons services harm environment. And we see both sides, Russia and Ukraine, and in also how can indiscriminate attacks mean principles, military necessity, and non unnecessary suffering. In our opinion, Turkey's historic important opportunity at this point, realization, Ukraine Western backers to have say how to work and will be common solution model. Turkey support always achieved the diplomacy, just and peace, but honorable and appreciation the whole of the world. Our aim, peace and love and brotherhood Thank you for attention. I wish to remember again, as I am coming originally in April, we are in the same plane in our hands, the future. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention to me. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Kashin. Uh, a very meaningful metaphor uh, in the last, uh, on the last slide. Uh, we are in the same uh, plane and uh, from the same the same plane uh, of the conference, uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Alberto Zucconi, uh, chair of uh, World Academy of Arts and Science. Uh, Dr. Zucconi, you have the floor. I would like to excuse uh, Dr. Zucconi. He uh, the had uh, he announced me that he will be in delay for a few minutes. And uh, also, uh, Dr. Markova, she is just uh, around here, but uh, we, we couldn't find her. So I propose, uh, first of all, to announce uh, all the participants online that uh, here there is a Q&A button. So if you look on the bottom side, there is a Q&A uh, button where each of you, you could uh, put uh, either directly on chat, you can put uh, your uh, questions and uh, comments, or uh, if you would like, uh, you, we can even uh, open uh, you to, uh, to make an online comment. So uh, uh, waiting for the two uh, speakers, for uh, uh, Dr. Tsutoni and uh, for Dr. Markova, I would like uh, to kindly ask you, uh, Mr. Chairman, to uh, uh, raise a very important question that uh, raised up during uh, these uh, first three extremely 
uh, important uh, presentations. So uh, you remember that uh, the Black Sea region has been uh, historically the contributor to the mankind philosophy by defining the governance models. So we have one model that is based on Aristotle contribution, that means uh, uh, governance based on a wise, uh, intelligent ruler. Sometimes that was defined as a dictatorship, but sometimes it has been uh, considered as a new approach to, uh, to governance. Uh, and the second one is the democratic uh, approach. So my question is, uh, if you allow me, Mr. Chairman, to, uh, to uh, Gary Jacobs, uh, uh, when you are thinking for new models of governance for artificial intelligence, uh, what kind of ideas or suggestions would you have? Thank you for a, a very provocative uh, question, Eben, uh, one that the, the world is searching for. Uh, and I, I just, my uh, initial comment would be, uh, after 75 years of trying to govern uh, atomic energy, uh, so far we have succeeded in avoiding a repeat of what took place in 1945, uh, uh, though the threat remains and is even proliferated uh, more widely and we find it coming back again. So the model that we had then of trying to get a global consensus and trying to get the, the founding of the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency as, a, as an instrument uh, for that, and then the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty has in one sense been successful in avoiding a repeat of 1945, but has not eliminated the threat as we are all aware uh, in doing so. Uh, by comparison, the challenge we have in AI is actually much greater uh, because the it is possible to, to track the proliferation of nuclear energy and especially nuclear testing. And it depends on uh, the sources of radioactive material, which are difficult to conceal uh, and so forth. The problem, it, it can only be done by enormous investments in technology. The problem in AI is that it's almost impossible to detect. Uh, and it can be done on a very small scale and it can be done uh, by without the huge resources that are required for uh, a, a atomic energy and all. And therefore, the problem of proliferation is much, much greater. Uh, and that's one of the, there is a consensus, I think, of, uh, of the, uh, around the world that it needs to be controlled. But the difficulties of doing so are, uh, are even greater than it is with the atomic energy. Uh, and therefore, that's the struggle to go first arriving at some models or standards, and that is taking place in the last three years uh, in OECD and UNESCO, in the UN, uh, in EU, and in other places. And that's an important, and within corporations and within uh, business bodies as well. Uh, but that's that helps us with a guideline. Uh, but how to actually control it, in fact, it's very tip. Your question is very uh, uh, timely because we had a meeting with UNESCO last week where they asked us <laughs> to help them with the implementation of their standards on a global basis. And that's the real uh, dilemma. Uh, and I don't have a, uh, uh, we don't have a, a, an easy answer to that, uh, especially when we see, as, is, as was just demonstrated by uh, uh, Professor Kassin, especially when we see the temptation uh, to utilize this uh, for uh, uh, on the military side is so great. Uh, and that is our dilemma. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, there is no single answer for that. Our effort and the effort, I think an important effort of this meeting 
and of the, the, the WASP Black Sea University Initiative and the others uh, is to sensitize the scientific community that, that we have to be part of the solution, uh, that we cannot just leave the solution uh, to politics or government and the scientific community, not only working in for the public sector, but scientists working in the private sector as well. And we have seen those scientists in the private sector who have created marvelous uh, in advances, standing, stepping up and speaking on the need for this. So there's a greater public awareness and there's a greater it's a social responsibility among the scientific community. Uh, but how to translate this into reality, I think we see that unless it's part of a larger solution, unless it's part of a solution that ensures or secures uh, uh, the, 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 the peace of, uh, of nations between each other, it will be very hard for us to, uh, uh, to find an adequate mechanism. We can have responsible parties who will act responsibly, but that will not easily prevent uh, others from taking advantage of it, just as we have a problems like that with the internet. So you have challenged us <laughs> with your question, and it's a question we should all be working on at sleepless nights until we find a solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to draw the attention, uh, Professor. Uh, just a moment. Just a moment. Like, uh, Alberto King, yes. Alberto is in. Very good. <laughs> uh, uh, Professor Mahmoud, before uh, uh, Shifting to the to to the, uh, the next speaker or to the next question for uh, the former speakers, I would like to use my uh, privilege of uh, uh, having access to the mic and uh, to give you not the opinion of the uh, of the chairperson, but uh, my opinion as participant and, and as sociologist. I fully agree with President Jacobs. There is not one answer, but I will I would uh, dare to to say that. When it comes to the part of the, you know, general aspects related to uh, artificial intelligence, for instance, access to artificial intelligence, um, uh, uh, there is a, a role of uh, uh, of the of all the participants. That's why the democracy here looks more adequate uh, for making decision uh, related to access to. Uh, uh, or, or ethical issues uh, uh, to protection of individual data and so on and so forth. When it comes to specific aspects, for instance, to uh, expert decisions, in that, that case, not the political people, but uh, a small group of professionals, of experts, must make the decision and decide. Uh, so that's why I would also uh, vote for a balance between the power of all the power, the power of the majority, uh, and uh, the power of experts when it comes to specific decisions. So on the other hand, uh, I would not go for autocracy because political persons that will have too much access on technology, on such immense power that artificial intelligence uh, has been producing could be more dangerous than the ignorance of the uh, people when it comes to uh, specific and, and, uh, and technical issues. So it's, if you have, yeah. if you want my opinion, I vote for democracy plus uh, uh, the experts for specific issues. Will the deputy chairman, Mr. Jacob, has given one important point I have to emphasize this situation, Mr. Mao says. Yes, of course, artificial intelligence is going very important our human life and human security. And he emphasized about what happened in the accident in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The question is, did we learn his lessons from the, what is the impact of the nuclear warfare? Even the United Nations and International Atomic Energy Agency is working and NPT nuclear proliferation, the agreement is in terms of the international is very, uh, it, how can I say detail about this situation? But today, you remember the beginning of the Russia and Ukraine warfare is energy security. Today, we are in the negative impact the since the Russian sanctions and we buy the 
high expensive the oil and gas, the winter is coming. On the other side, the when you're looking Brzezinski side, the the West is doing a mistake to pressure the Russia. Why? The Russia is going to cooperation and strategic partnership with China. And the China is going well and challenges to the even the Pacific and even now in Taiwan. This means I'm seeing the Black Sea problem is together we can solve this. And then we can bring the, how can we go more the, uh, the cheaper the energy to the marketing and to the, our people. And the all the neighbor states has to come together in the establishment security of the navigation in the Black Sea. It's very important. Today is ongoing war. It's bringing, I'll give the one example to you, if the mine is coming to exploding the, our fisheries in the Black Sea, what can we do? Human security is very important at time. I mean, the, excuse me, food and energy, high prices going to our pocket is very, the, 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 how can I say, the, the, the bad expensive of the, uh, the impact. As a result, the, the economic impact bringing another problem Seven million people migrated from Ukraine to the Poland and the also Western countries. I hope that as a final in this point, I must the emphasize and underline that in the terms of the territorial integration and independence of Ukraine, that all the people has to be stopped this um, lawful the warfare in the Black Sea. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you again. Uh... Uh, as uh, the previous speakers uh, uh, underlined, uh, those issues are global, international and global, so uh, solutions for them must be uh, uh, global, international, and all the involved uh, participant actors must be consulted and must uh, uh, take part in uh, uh, the decision-making process. Uh, uh, Professor Mahmoud, do we have... Uh, uh, yeah. the Dr. Dr. Alberto Zucconi is here and he is going to introduce a new dimension into this discussion regarding the trauma uh, aspects and the trauma informed care. Excellent. Please, uh, Dr. Zucconi, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, okay, these images from Ukraine speak. Uh, more than the words uh, about uh, what happens uh, when uh, human security is destroyed. Still Ukraine. This is Turkey after the earthquake. Syria. Libya after the flooding. A lot of places, unfortunately, with climate change. That's our doing. So I think uh, we really need uh, to uh, join forces uh, and effectively defend and promote human security as a sacred right. And uh, we have to do it uh, every day, everywhere, where we live, love, and work in reality. So, as you know, so human security has seven uh, topics, economy, food, the health, environment, personality, community, and politics. Uh, and uh, already in 94, the United Nations uh, Human Development Report, uh, uh, in uh, this report uh, that said new dimension human security, they underlined that human security is a people-centered, is concerned with how people live and breathe in society, how freely they exercise their many choices. So it's clear to everybody how humongous destruction of human security is expensive at every level. And they created not only immense suffering, loss of lives, and traumatize people in our ecosystem. So since uh, we live uh, in a complex system, everything is interconnecting, everything is affected when uh, someplace uh, human security is destroyed. Uh, the General Assembly, General Assembly Resolution of the United Nations uh, 
says that, that the human security is an approach to assist the member state in identifying and addressing widespread and cross-cutting challenges to the survival, livelihood, and dignity of their people. It calls for people-centered, comprehensive, context-specific, and prevention-oriented response that strengthens the protection and empowerment of all the people. I have uh, the director of the postdoctoral specialization uh, with me that is, I'm teaching uh, in his uh, university. My friend and colleague, uh, thank you. Uh, call yourself. Good morning. He's the co-director of the Trauma Informed Care Best Practice, uh, Professor Rollet. So, one of the burdens that, that is caused by the destruction of human security is unfortunately psychological trauma. And if people are traumatized in many cases, especially if they are young children, they would get severe damage on the mental and the physical side. And if not treated effectively, even pass it to the next generation. Um, trauma is a, a very large, harmful, and costly for individual and society, and it's the result of being subject to violence, abuse, neglect, loss, disaster, war, many other uh, form of violent discrimination, uh, racism, uh, gender discrimination. So, as I said, uh, an address of trauma significantly increased the risk of mental and substantial abuse uh, disorder and chronic uh, physical disease. Trauma has no boundaries uh, uh, and it hits, affects everybody. Uh, this is Shamsa, that is uh, one of the most uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, international organizations dealing with the issue of trauma. How we deal effectively with trauma? We have created, uh, also thanks uh, to the mistake of the past, uh, the ignorance of the past, uh, what is called trauma-informed care. What it is, uh, is the, to be central the person of the human survival, of the trauma survival, to be aware of the issue and to be updated about the, what uh, we find about trauma. is a scientifically grounded uh, approach, uh, preventing a re-traumatization and offering service uh, and structure and organization that lower the risk of re-traumatization and maximize the possibility of effective treatment and recovery, in some cases, uh, even growth from trauma. Uh, today, we really have uh, come a long way, the last 30 years, uh, and so we can deal uh, effectively. And uh, again, extension of the person, uh, of the service user is fundamental. Person-centered care complemented with the recovery-oriented care and trauma-informed care need to be the basis of universal, universal approach to health care. Why? Because uh, the trauma uh, affects millions of people every year and it was already really high the burden before the invasion of Ukraine and now we have also the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, the forced migration. So uh, it hits everybody at the level of the survivor, their family, community, country, everywhere in the world. So we need to really do something. The World Academy of Art and Science, the Black Sea University Network, the Person Center Approach Institute with the Department of Psychology of the University of Turin and many other partners, 
have created the, the trauma-informed care best practice process, for short, the TIC process, uh, where we offer for free, totally for free, to people, organizations uh, that are dealing uh, in various roles, uh, psychological trauma, uh, free training and free training material. Here are the uh, partnership uh, members uh, up to now. Of course, uh, we open uh, to discuss a new partnership uh, to people that uh, share the value and the aims. Uh, and if interested, please contact me. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, we need uh, to also uh, enlarge because the requests are mounting uh, and uh, we are hard pressed uh, not to say no to anybody. Still, we need uh, some uh, uh, human resources uh, and uh, economic resources uh, to fill all the requests. Uh, and so uh, we are also welcoming not only partnership, but uh, also donations that are tax stamped uh, in the United Nations uh, and uh, in uh, uh, Canada. But uh, from December, our president, Gary Jacobs, tell me that uh, we would be able also to raise money in Europe for uh, tax stamped. Uh, and speaking with that, and uh, perhaps also with the Black Sea Network, uh, the bureaucracy, unfortunately, is a little bit uh, tough. So all together, we can deal effectively with this. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, indeed, Professor Tsutkoni. Uh, a very uh, useful contribution. Uh, it's important to add uh, uh, trauma and all the related aspects to our, uh, to our debate. And uh, then, uh, if uh, Dr. Markova is present, uh, unfortunately, Dr. unfortunately, Dr. Markova is in a very important discussion. Actually, Dr. Markova is uh, the former director of the State Commission for uh, Information Security, and she is a very busy person. <laughs> so from that perspective, she just uh, left and she's in on phones with different other discussions. So maybe it would be better to go uh, with, the with the conclusions, if you allow me, I have uh, also- Yes, please, yeah. I have one question uh, to, uh, the very distinguished uh, professor, Afzal Ashra. So Afzal, you mentioned about uh, the work of Tegmark. And um, of course, uh, in, uh, in his work and uh, all the activity that he's developing with his group and so on, and the meetings at MIT and so on, he tried to promote a positive, uh, let's say, opinion regarding the future of artificial intelligence. And uh, we can go with this uh, positive approach. So first of all, there are two ideas that I would like to, uh, to express your opinion on that. First of all, about the idea that was promoted by Techmark uh, regarding the uh, global artificial intelligence. So is it possible for the humanity to jump, to leapfrog, in intelligence and wisdom, in understanding, by appropriate use, in the sense that uh, Gary was presenting here. This is one question. And the second one, you mentioned also about the potential of uh, blockchain technologies and other similar technologies. And I'm coming to the, to the point that uh, Professor Freda made regarding the very important role of reconsidering always democracy and to find out inclusiveness uh, in, at all levels, at the level of small communities, at the level of larger communities, and so on. What is the potential of such technologies like, like uh, blockchain technology to boost the approach on, and the efficiency of democracy? Because that's the major backslash of democracy, lack of efficiency. You've asked it two very deep questions. Each one could result in a conference in its own right. 
Um, so the positive aspect of Ted Mark, and I think that's a very good point that you made. I quoted his concern, and his concern was actually precisely the concern that you debated uh, with the president of WSS just now uh, about governance. And again, you, you you raise a very good point, very, um, I think, substantive point. What was form of governance? Would it be benign dictatorship or would it be uh, a democratic? And, and quite frankly, I'm scribbling some notes to that very question because I think it's a, 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 a decent question. I probably haven't got time to go through that. But um, it is positive. It's whether we like it or not, it's here. It's already here and it's going to come here when we want it. And it's going to deliver huge benefits if we use it properly. It has some potential to deliver harm, some significant potential to deliver harm if we um, misuse it. But I think here um, there is an important uh, distinction when we carry our models, which we have to of the past, to the future. And what we do as human beings, which I, I, I don't do, we have to simplify things to understand it. And in so doing, we create myths, which are truths, because we believe in them, but not necessarily the truth. Let me give you one, um, going back to the example uh, that uh, Mr. Jacob we talked about the nuclear weapons uh, uh, and the NPT, NTP, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and yes, it's been a success. But why has it been a success? A partial success? Well, it's been part, uh, it's partial success for two reasons. One was that um, it was in the interest of the nuclear powers to um, retain their nuclear weapons, but not to allow proliferation because that would have affected the balance of power. But it wasn't in the interest of the nuclear powers to use those weapons because of the concept of mutually assured destruction. So in many ways, the treaty was surfing on the wave of self interest But I'm not saying it was useless, it was very important. But that privileged position that those nuclear powers had incentivized other powers like India, Pakistan, Israel, and others to develop, and now North Korea to develop weapons. So the point is, we need to look at these very carefully. Um, and if we're going to address, begin to address the governance problem of AI that Taymar talks about, um, and he's concerned is that we're going to look at our things, then we need to start beginning to think. We can't answer the question, but we need to think. And so right now I respectfully suggest that we need to think that now we don't have a state threat. We have a threat that's multi-layer state, as has been uh, spoken about that fantastic presentation on the use of military, the states have incentives, but they also have disincentives. And there are myths that great powers use. Now, one of the great myths that's underlying that presentation you saw, which anybody, and I'm an ex-military officer, would give you, is that if we have smarter weapons, we have greater military capability. But if that's true, then the last half a century of wars that the United States has been involved in would have resulted in victory. In Afghanistan, they would have virtually all of that maybe less the AI element, and they were fighting an enemy that only had plastic bombs, and the most potent weapon they had was an RPG. They won, the Americans lost. And so we need to challenge our beliefs in what is effective, what is in our self-interest. The second layer after states is corporations, and corporations are already interested, because they've got interest in, in, in incentives, they've also got disincentives. And then finally, and this is the most important thing, what AI does is democratize capability, it democratize education, it democratize economics, but it also democratize weaponry. And it is how we control that. The good news, and uh, we can talk about this in detail, the good news is that it incentivizes states to control their 
the world act as well as their individual sort of needs. And if we can use that in the center, then we can tell state leaders that if you take a privileged position yourself and use these, weapons, uh, these technologies for weapons, then you will have less credibility in effect on these rogue actors who deliberately all uh, uh, accidentally produce harmful AI products. I know I haven't answered your question, but to answer your question fully, we would be here for a long time. Uh, but I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, but you also opened <laughs> much more other questions. So I don't want uh, to thank you very much for these uh, points, very, very important. I would like, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you allow me, I have seen in the audience. So uh, uh, Matthew Dillonen is uh, representing the European uh, grid infrastructure, the so-called EGI, which is a federation of all large digital infrastructures Europe-wide. And uh, the good thing and the good experience of EGI is that EGI offered access to all small players around Europe to use large supercomputer facilities. And in this way, is coming to what you are also saying, that democratizing the access, offering a wider access to the technology, this would raise the awareness, the, let's say, appropriate, uh, uh, how can I say, concerns and approaches and so on. So uh, together with the uh, EGI, we as DSUN, we have a partnership uh, agreement. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Matthew is also involved in some other teleconferences and so on. So for this reason, we cannot uh, jump in. But uh, I would like uh, to put this uh, question to the other uh, participants in the audience. And uh, I see also uh, Professor Sakala is uh, representing uh, the Polytechnica University of Bucharest. And I was wondering what is your opinion regarding the aspects of how the universities could contribute to uh, the, let's say, democratic and, uh, and uh, uh, let's say, civilian use of uh, the benefits of artificial uh, intelligence. Professor Mahmoud, thank you for the question. It's a difficult question. Uh, first of all, because at this moment, artificial intelligence is, uh, let's say, from the research point of view, uh, at an unknown stage. Currently, we don't know the real impact of AI, so it's difficult to quantify it and to be able to introduce it in our curricula in order to adapt for the future. But I think that uh, what we should do and what we could do, first of all, uh, I think that we need to have more researchers involved at an academic level in artificial intelligence. Uh, our university, which is considered to be one of the most important technical universities in uh, Romania, currently don't have too many researchers involved in artificial intelligence. And that's a major problem. I think that we need to have more and more researchers involved in uh, the concept of machine learning, of quantum computing, and for that reason, we need to have access to technology, to quantum computers, which are very difficult to find and uh, to, to have access to them because they are very expensive, we have to be honest, especially for the budget uh, that we have in Eastern Europe uh, allocated for uh, research. What else we could do is uh, try to teach our students that artificial intelligence is important as long as it helps us in the future, not to replace the jobs that we are trying to teach our students that currently don't know how future will be and we also don't know how future will be. So from this demogra demographic aspect, it's very difficult to 
teach our students what the impact of artificial intelligence could uh, could be and how they need to adapt in the future what i suggest is that is that we should wait maybe a little bit more to see what future will bring us from this perspective this is my my opinion at this moment i don't know if you yeah, if you yeah, hear yeah. me thank you very much uh, professor yeah. so i pass uh, now the microphone to professor freda but we have also uh, a kind of request on behalf of uh, Afsal here from the room. He would like also to make a point if you allow, uh, Professor Brenner. Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Uh, well, I, yes. I would just say that in answer to your question, which has been very well answered already about uh, the impact on educational knowledge, uh, there is, of course, yes and no. Yes, in that uh, uh, the ability of artificial intelligence to gather and to present vast arrays of information in a very easy manner is phenomenal. It's already having an impact on education. The problem, of course, is that um, the current uh, uh, levels of AI do not have understanding, whilst they appear to be wise and well understood, well learned, they actually are uh, parrots. They parrot what they have and they make up. Um, uh, bits in between, which are described as hallucinogenic, which are sometimes completely false. And these are being demonstrated, and I can show examples of that at time of, of that problem. The big problem we have is the generation of organic language as opposed to artificial, uh, sort of organic knowledge as opposed to artificial knowledge is a distinction we will need to get used to. And I predict in some ways that um, as we go shopping in our supermarkets, we now pay a little bit extra for organically grown food as opposed to artificially grown food. And I think that is what's going to uh, be the discriminator. And, and it is those societies that, that invest in, and this is where the university audience really needs to uh, pay attention. It's those societies that invest in organic uh, learning that are going to improve. But that organic learning can't continue to be non-democratic because it is. Because one of the greatest myths of our modern times is the sort of thing that you talked about. Aristotle has answered the question. The Western world believes that its inheritance, philosophical inheritance, good if it is, is universal. It is the vast majority of the world is silent. And what AI will do or has the potential to do is to get those alternative ideas, or those alternative philosophies, those alternative truths that will allow us to become truly democratic. Hence my example of those African boys and girls sitting in their villages. They have a wisdom that we need to benefit from if we're going to truly hope. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Very good point. Very positive. And uh, thank you for doing that.